They see him here. They see him here. And they see him here. We know it because he said it. Jesus said, the world will see him when the world sees us. That's why together we do this. We give so that those who've not yet seen can see. It means something when the world sees how we give. It means something because we do not look the same. It means something because we do not sound the same. It means something because when we give, this is what the world sees. They see the gospel doing what the world cannot. They see the gospel making us one. And so we give. We give so that missionaries can go. We give so that churches can be started, hurts can be healed, and truth can be shared. We give so the world might see Jesus in us. United, United as one. one. Well, praise the Lord. It is so good to see you in the Lord's house today on this Spring Forward Sunday. I'm thankful that you are here. And uh, always, this time of year, I look forward to giving to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering that takes the gospel of Jesus Christ all across our country through our North American Mission Board and the great work that they're doing. And so I would encourage you to pray about what God would have you give this year to Annie Armstrong. This morning, I want you to take your Bibles. If you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. And today I'm preaching on the dynamics of surrendered faith. You know, we are seeking revival at Quail Springs Baptist Church. And I really see in so many ways God is bringing revival. Next week we'll be having our Oklahoma Glory Revival. It starts next Sunday morning right here in this place. You don't want to miss it. We'll have an incredible time of worship on Sunday morning. Then we'll come back here again at 5.30 on Sunday night. During the daytime on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 10.30, right here we'll be having uh, worship and praise and, and uh, great preaching for revival. We'll have a luncheon following that each day. And then on Wednesday night at 6.30, we'll come back in this place. I pray that God will do a great and mighty work of revival during our week of Oklahoma Glory Revival next week. Please be in prayer. We're going to be having a prayer time from 4 to 6 on Saturday afternoon, next Saturday. I would encourage you to come. That'll be over in the chapel. We've got 422 people who have signed up to say, we will be prayer warriors. We're looking for 500, and so we're almost there. People praying for that revival. Pray for our guest evangelist, Dr. Phil Waldrop. Pray for Dr. Gary Mathena, who will be leading in worship. And then we'll have great music throughout the week. But most of all, pray that God would bring revival. Right now, I want us to look in the Word of God, Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. We're going to begin in verse 15. Stand with me as we read God's Word together. Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. We'll begin in verse 15, continue down through verse 30. Every one of these passages, every one of these verses that we're going to look at today have to do with what it means to follow Jesus with surrendered faith. I want you to hear me say this very clearly. When God looks at your life, God is looking for surrender. He's looking for you to say goodbye to anything that would keep you from following him fully and to say yes to fully following Jesus Christ in a surrendered life. When he looks at us, he is looking for surrender. And at the point of surrender, he brings revival and renewal and blessing into our lives. Listen to what the Bible says beginning in verse 15 of our text. Now they were bringing even infants to Jesus that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. 
When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, see, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. These are the words of Jesus. Join with me as we pray. Lord God, we love you and praise you. We thank you for this good day that you've given us today. And Lord, I pray that you would move me out of the way and Lord, speak that we would hear your voice. And Lord, work in our hearts that we would surrender ourselves to you. Lord, I pray for those in this room today who have never been saved. Lord, right now, show them how much you love them and show them how much they need you, that today they might surrender themselves to Jesus and receive your gift of salvation. And then, Father, I pray for believers in this room because, God, you call each of us to continual surrender. Lord, show us what surrender looks like for us. Show us what we're holding on to that's keeping us from fully surrendering. And Lord, give us your grace to surrender fully to you today, Jesus. We'll give you glory and honor, Lord, for all that you do. For Jesus, we pray these things in your holy name. And church, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. If you were in an airplane in the cockpit, Right before takeoff, I mean in the moment before takeoff, you would hear either the co-pilot or the captain say, V1. V1 is a signal that the plane has reached what we might call a decision speed. It's reached a point at, of no return, at which time the pilot has to take off the plane. It can't stay on the runway anymore. It can't stay on the earth anymore. It has to take off. It's decision speed. Up until that moment, things can change. Up until that moment, things can, can slow down and the flight can be aborted. But when they reach V1, the plane has to take off. It surrenders itself to flight. For every believer in Jesus Christ, for everyone who would follow Jesus, there is that V1 moment, that decision speed we reach, where we have to say, yes, Lord, I will follow you. So many of us get right up to that point, and then we stop, and we don't experience what God wants to us, us to experience because we're not willing to say, Jesus, I will surrender fully to you. Think about some of the songs that we sing about following Jesus. That song that says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. What's the next line? No turning back. No turning back. There comes that moment where we say, Jesus, I'm surrendering to you. Another song that we sing, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender. What's the next word? All. That's the only way you can come to Jesus on terms of full surrender. You can't be saved without surrender. And Christian friend, I would tell you this, you can't follow Jesus. You can't experience the life and the blessing and the purpose and the meaning and the revival that God desires in your life unless you are surrendered to him day by day, the Christian life is a life of daily surrender. And we see that in the passage of Scripture that we've just read together. Now, as we look at this text, 
I want you to notice with me four things that Jesus Christ says about surrender. Four aspects of surrender that Jesus addresses in this text. And the first aspect is this. Jesus talks to us about the demonstration of surrendered faith. The demonstration of surrendered faith. And we see that in these children who were being brought to Jesus. Notice what the Bible says in verse 15. Now they were bringing even infants to Jesus that he might touch them. The Bible says they were bringing infants to Jesus. The the word infant there can mean a a child who's a newborn baby or even up to a couple of years old. And so these are parents maybe or or maybe grandparents or other people who care about uh, these children and they're bringing these children to Jesus just for Jesus to touch them and bless them. Because they know that Jesus has a special anointing from God. And they know that Jesus teaches like no one else teaches. And some of them have even come to know that Jesus is the Son of God. And so they want Jesus to touch their children. So it's a beautiful scene. All of these people bringing these small children to Jesus. And the children are coming and and they're running. And some of them are are being held in the arms of their parents or grandparents or, or family members. And they're coming to Jesus. And in the midst of this beautiful scene, the disciples interrupted. Can I stop right there? Sometimes people who are trying to follow Jesus stop Jesus from doing the beautiful things he wants to do. And so these parents are bringing these children to Jesus and the children are coming to Jesus, but the disciples saw it. And when they saw it, they rebuked them. They they did something to stop these children from coming. Verse 16, Jesus called them to him saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. I love those words of Jesus, don't you? Let the children come to me. Don't do anything to put up a barrier. Don't do anything to stop them. Don't do anything to discourage them. Don't do anything to hinder them. Let the children come to me and do not hinder them. And then look at the next thing. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus was saying God's kingdom, he he talked about God's kingdom all the time. God's kingdom is, is the rule and reign of God in your life. God's kingdom means living with a personal relationship with the God of this universe through his son, Jesus Christ. God's kingdom, Jesus says, belongs to such as these, like these little children coming to me. He's not just saying that his kingdom is only for children, although certainly his kingdom is open to children. He's saying his kingdom is open to those who come to him like children. In verse 17, he goes further. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. These children coming to Jesus are a demonstration of what surrendered faith looks like. To come to Jesus with a surrendered faith means coming to him like a child would come to him. Means coming to him like a child would come to a parent. You know, when a child comes, there's a simplicity in the way that child comes. The child doesn't have to have every question answered. She just comes. When a child comes, there's a humility in the way that child comes. A a child doesn't come with a spiritual resume of all of his accomplishments and all the things that he's done to commend himself to the Lord. He just comes. When a child comes, there's a love in the way that child comes. He loves Jesus and he wants to be close to Jesus. When a child comes, there's a surrender to say, I will do whatever it takes to come to the Lord. That's how Jesus Christ calls us to come to him with a loving, humble, simple, surrendered faith. So many times when Jesus calls us to come to him, we get all caught up in, well, exactly what does that mean? And how do I do that? And what questions do I need to have answered first? Or am I coming in the right way? Am I saying the right things? Have I gotten everything taken care of? No, Jesus just wants you to come to him. Just start where you are and come to him. Imagine a mother speaking to her little girl 
And she says, honey, come over here and I'll give you this fruit snack. Now, what's that little girl thinking about? As soon as her mother says, come over here and I'll give you that, this fruit snack. The little girl is not thinking about anything other than that fruit snack and her mother. She's thinking about the snack that she wants. She's thinking about her mother who loves her, who's offering it to her. She's not thinking about how am I going to get over there. She'll get over there however she can get over there. If she's able to walk, she'll walk over there. If she's still a toddler, she'll toddle over there. If she falls down, she'll get back up and she'll, she'll keep coming. If she's only able to crawl, she'll crawl over there. If she, I remember when our, our, our son was a little baby, before he learned to crawl and he wanted something, he just rolled over on his back, just keep rolling over until he got, she'll roll over there. They will do whatever they have. They will sit there and cry until mom comes and brings it to them. But what they're not thinking about is, am I coming in the right way? Mom's offered something, the baby wants it, she comes and gets it. When you come to Jesus, when he calls you to come to himself, don't think about how you're going to get there. Just think about the fact that the one who loves you with all of his heart has called you to come and come. No step we ever take toward Jesus is a wrong step. Every step we take toward Jesus is a right step. And so you just come. And yet we say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm saying the right things. Or I'm not sure if I've got the right motive. Or I'm not sure if I'm coming the right way. I, I've heard people who say, I need to get saved, but I don't want to just say, get saved because I don't want to go to hell. I've heard people, I want to get saved, but I don't want to just say, get saved because I don't want to go to hell. Can I tell you something? Not going to hell is a great reason to get saved. However you can come to Jesus, you come to Jesus. And that's true for salvation, but then that's true for every part of the Christian life after that. Jesus calls you to come, and you may come stumbling, and you may come unsure of why you're coming, or you may come with mixed motives, you, but you just come to him, and he'll take care of everything else when you come to him. He'll take care of the mixed motives when you get to him. He'll take care of the unanswered questions when you get to him. He'll take care of the things you don't understand when you get to him. You just come to him. That is simple, childlike faith. That's a demonstration of surrendered faith. Secondly, as we look at this text of Scripture, Jesus talks to us about the demand of surrendered faith. The demand of surrendered faith. Look in verse 18 of the text. The Bible says, a ruler asked him, right in context with what was happening, a ruler, we, we usually call him the rich, young ruler. His story occurs in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew tells us that he was young. Luke tells us that he was a ruler and that he was very rich. And so we usually call him the rich, young ruler. He was a ruler. What does that mean? That means he had some type of position of authority in the Jewish community. He may have been a ruler or a leader in the synagogue who, who took care of things at the synagogue in his community. Or he may have risen up to a level of leadership in the Jewish Sanhedrin even at a young age. But he was sort of a rising star, a rich, young ruler. He was very successful. People recognized his, his leadership ability. And so this rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Man, that was a great question. Jesus, I recognize that you're a good teacher. So what do I need to do? If you're telling me that, that, that I can't enter into the kingdom of God unless I'm like a little child, what do I need to do in order to inherit eternal life. And Jesus, before he answered the rich young ruler's question, asked him a question. He said, verse 19, Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And Jesus was asking that question for, for a couple of reasons. One, to, to show him that when you call me good, when you recognize that supernatural goodness in me, Jesus was saying, you're seeing God in me. He was identifying himself as the Son of God. But then also in saying no one is good except God alone, he was reminding this rich young ruler that when you surrender yourself to God and his kingdom, you are surrendering yourself to one who is absolutely and perfectly good. Listen, it is, 
It is a blessing and a joy to surrender ourselves to our God because our God is so good. Psalm 34 verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Nahum chapter 1 verse 17 says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. So we come to the Lord on terms of full surrender, knowing that God is good. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And then Jesus begins to challenge this rich young ruler, about his own goodness. He says, you know the commandments. He says, the commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. He gave him five of the ten commandments. And the rich young ruler said, all these I have kept from my youth. And some have looked at that response and said, well, the rich young ruler was being prideful. But Jesus never contradicted him or corrected him. He just took him further. He said, okay, all those you've kept from your youth. And then when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Now, here's here's what Jesus was doing. He was looking at a good, moral, unsurrendered man. Someone who was good, who kept God's commandments, but still lived his life on his own terms. And Jesus looked into this man's heart and he honed in on the one part of his life that was unsurrendered. Can I promise you this about you? When Jesus looks at you, he sees that part of your life that is unsurrendered. He sees it. And not only does he see it, he's after that. He demands it. Because until you've given him that one unsurrendered part, or maybe two or three unsurrendered parts of your life, until you've surrendered to him what is right now unsurrendered, then he can't do what he wants to do in your life. And so he says, one thing, look again, verse 22, one thing you still lack. And here was the one unsurrendered part of this man's life. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. He said, here's the one area. You're very wealthy, so I want you to give up everything that you have. Sell everything that you have. Give it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven, and now you come, follow me. Giving away all your property will not get you into heaven. But giving up whatever it is that is keeping you from following Jesus is the key to a surrendered life life. For you, it may be your money. For most people, it has to do with money or property or position or something that this life has to offer. It may be something else. It may be a relationship. It may be an attitude that you hold on to. It may be some sin in your life that you've made excuses for and you've decided that that's okay and you're not going to let it go. But Jesus looks at that one unsurrendered part of your life And he says, until you're willing to surrender that, you cannot fully follow him. Some of you are here and you've never trusted in Jesus as your Savior because you're still holding on to that unsurrendered part of your life. And then there are Christians who are here and you're not following Jesus the way he wants you to follow him because there's some part of your life that you're still saying, Lord, I'll say yes to you in a hundred other areas, but I'm never going to say yes to you in this. And as long as you're unsurrendered to that one point, your life still remains unsurrendered. And so Jesus gave this man a choice. Are you going to hold on to your stuff or are you going to follow me? There's a game that, that sometimes kids play at parties. It's a game called Would You Rather. And would you rather is just based on some simple questions. It says, would you rather do this or would you rather do that? And some of the questions are pretty funny. L- listen to some of these and, and you tell me what you would rather do. Here's one question. Would you rather make a one-minute speech to 10,000 people or kiss a frog? How many of you say speech? Raise your hands. Okay. Okay, good. How many of you say frog? I'd rather kiss a frog. Raise your hands. That was just about even, speech and frog. Here's another one. Would you rather have a name that everyone laughs at or have a face? that everyone laughs at. How many, how many of you would say, I'd rather have a name that people laugh at? Okay, that's, how many of you say, I'd rather have a name? 
raise you, or a face, a face there, but I went last week. Most, some people said face. Okay, that's interesting. Would you, here's one, now this one my wife and I disagreed on. Would you rather have seven toes on each foot or seven fingers on each hand? How many of you would rather have seven toes on each foot? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you would rather have seven fingers on each hand? Raise your hand. See, I'd rather do the hand, because I'm thinking if I had seven toes on each foot, I'd have to spend money on custom shoes all my life. That cost me a lot of money. I'd be better off with seven fingers on each hand. How many of you would rather have an elephant's trunk attached to your face or a neck as long as a giraffe? How many of you would say, I'll take the trunk? Raise your hand. Stay with me on this. How many of you would rather have the giraffe's neck? Raise your hand. More on giraffe's neck. All right, here's the last one. How many of you would rather spring forward one hour or fall back one hour? <laughs> spring forward one hour. How many? Okay, if you, how many fall back one hour? On this day, absolutely true. You say, Pastor, what are you, I, Pastor we know you're going on, somewhere with that. Where are you going with it? Here's where I'm going with it. Jesus gave the rich young ruler a would you rather question. Here's what he said. Would you rather... Have your stuff, or would you rather give it up, follow me, and have eternal life? Man, simple question. Would you rather hold on to your stuff, or would you rather surrender that, follow me, and have eternal life? And what did the rich young ruler say? I'd rather have my stuff. Man, when we talk about it in this setting, it it seems pretty clear. Boy, it'd be better to let go of that stuff and follow Jesus. But so many times in our lives, we hold on to whatever it is. It might be stuff. It might be an attitude. It might be a habit. Whatever it is, we'll hold on to that. When Jesus says, let that go and follow him, that's the demand of a surrendered faith. Say, Jesus, I'll let things go. I'll let this unsurrendered part of my life go so that I can follow you. Thirdly, I want you to see this. Jesus talks about the difficulty of surrendered faith. Look in verse 23 of the text. When he heard these things, the rich young ruler, when he heard what Jesus said, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Not because their wealth itself keeps them out of God's kingdom, but because so many times they don't want to say goodbye to that wealth and surrender that in order to follow Christ. He said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Then he said, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. He said, that's just a simple illustration. He said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. One time I was in Israel and in the city of Jerusalem, and my guide said, hey, I want to take you to show, show you something, something I've only seen one time. He took me to this little side street into this old church, and inside this old church there was an ancient gate from there in Jerusalem, and that gate has been called the needle's eye. It's a very low and narrow gate, and and some people over the years, the the, the legend has become that that's what Jesus was talking about when he talked about a camel going through the eye of a needle. Can I tell you something? That's not true. That gate was built hundreds of years after the time of Jesus. And so Jesus wasn't talking about some narrow gate in the city of Jerusalem that it was hard for a camel to go through. That's not what he was talking about. He was being literal. He took the biggest animal that they had in Israel, a camel, and the smallest opening they could imagine, the eye of a sewing needle, and he said, it'd be easier to march that camel through the eye of that needle and to pull that camel through that needle's eye. That is easier, not not the same, easier than for a rich man to enter into heaven. Why? Because so many times when we have the things that life has to offer us, we hold on to those things at the cost of full surrender to Jesus. I'm not just talking about your money. I'm talking about anything 
this life has to offer you? Are you willing to let those things go in order to be fully surrendered to Jesus? If there's one unsurrendered part of your life, the devil will always build a road to that one unsurrendered part. Imagine you had a thousand acres of land and you decided to give away 999 of those acres, but you kept one acre right in the middle of all that land. If you kept that one acre, you'd have to build a road to get to it. And that's what the devil does when we have one unsurrendered part, whatever it is, that one unsurrendered part of your life The devil will build a road to that, and he'll keep you going back to that unsurrendered part, and he'll use that unsurrendered part of your life to keep you from experiencing what God wants you to experience. Because when, listen, when we surrender ourselves fully to him, that's where his fullest blessing comes. And he's always looking for surrender. When you pray, you're looking for an answer God is looking for surrender. When you serve, you're you're looking for something to do for the Lord. God is looking for surrender. When you give, you may look at how much you've given. God is looking for surrender in every part of our life. When you obey, you may be like this guy. And be able to say, I've done all these things. I've kept every law I know that God has from my youth. God is looking for surrender. And as long as you're holding on to that unsurrendered part of your life, God sees it. And the devil will build roads to it to keep you from being what God wants you to be. But there's a fourth thing I want you to notice in this text. Number four, the delight of surrendered faith. The delight of surrendered faith. Look in verse 28 of the text. Peter had been listening to this whole thing. He had been listening. He, 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 had, he had been one of the disciples that Jesus had rebuked for, for telling the children not to come to him. He had been one of those disciples in all likelihood. And he had heard this whole conversation with a rich young ruler. And so Peter brought up a point. He said, see, Lord, look, we have left our homes and followed you. Jesus, as far as we can see, we've done everything that, that you're talking to this guy about doing. They had. Jesus had come when Peter and Andrew were, were fishing and said, follow me, and they left their nets and followed him. They left their homes, and went far away and traveled places they'd never been before and experienced things they'd never experienced just to follow him. Lord, we have left our homes and followed you. And the unspoken question is, Lord, what do we receive? In some of the gospels, he actually asked that question. What do we receive? Here's the answer. Jesus said to him, verse 29, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time, in this life, and in the age to come, eternal life. In other words, Jesus was saying there is delight and reward that come to us at the point of surrender. If following Jesus requires you to leave behind your house and your property, if it requires you to leave behind your spouse, if it requires you to leave behind your brothers or sisters or your mom or dad or your kids, if you walk away and say goodbye to those things for the sake of saying yes to Jesus, you'll receive many times more in this life And in the age to come, eternal life. Here's what Jesus promises. When you surrender, there's always a reward. Always. There's always a blessing. Always. There's always delight. Always that comes on the other side of surrender. But you never experience that until you get past that V1 moment, until you get past that decision speed, and you get that past that point of no return and say, Lord, I will surrender. And I'll give myself over to you. Friendship with God 
and fellowship with God come at the point of surrender. After World War II was over, American General Douglas MacArthur was scheduled to meet with a Japanese general. The purpose of the meeting was for the Japanese general to surrender. They met in the appointed place, and when they met, the Japanese general extended his hand to shake hands with General Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur did not extend his hand. Instead, he said to the general, I cannot shake your hand until you surrender your sword. And the Japanese general took off his sword and surrendered it, and then at that point, they could shake hands. You cannot come to Jesus and be God's friend and walk hand in hand with him as long as you're holding on to an unsurrendered life. He calls you to lay down whatever it is. It may be your will, It may be your possessions, it may be a relationship, it may be a sin, it may be an attitude, whatever it is, you know what it is because you're holding on to it right now. When you lay that down in terms of full surrender, then you can come to him. 